welcome to episode 100 of the Game of Thrones Abridged podcast with Alt Swift X. I cannot believe it's episode 100. This is our this is our centenary or our or our century or or, or something. Um, I never thought we'd get to episode 100. I never thought we'd get to episode two. I didn't know I was doing an episode one when we did episode one. It was just a thing that happened, and then there was another thing after that, and then, you know, before you know it, we're, uh, we've been doing it for years, uh, and I'm so glad you're all here to do this episode. So, um, this is a podcast where we summarize and analyze each episode, each chapter of the A Song of Ice and Fire book series, uh, and we do it with, uh, with, with, with so much intense dedication to, a to a academical, literary approach. We're, 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 we take this very seriously here at Oxford X, and we never go off topic. We never go on tangents. We stay firmly adhered to the text. So today we're talking about Aya Six, A Clash of Kings, which is unfortunately like one of the darkest and most horrible chapters in the series. I would have liked a more like celebratory tone for episode 100, but this one is is really dark. Um, so I think what we might do is try and like get through it quickly and efficiently, as we always do, um, and then maybe get to another chapter. Like maybe we'll do a double feature for the first time ever. That'll be fun. Um, so we'll see how we go. Um, we're going to do a little charity raffle to celebrate the 100th episode. I don't know if you'll know what that is, but... Um, where 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 I come from, there's a there's no tradition more sanctified than a, a charity raffle. So whenever like you know the 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 local hopscotch team needs a new clubhouse, uh, you hold a raffle to raise some money. Whenever Auntie Ethel needs a new hip, everyone buys a raffle ticket, throws in a little cash, and just to spice it up and make it fun, there's a there's a prize for one lucky ticket holder where you get something you know traditionally it's like a wheelbarrow uh full of sausages is the traditional prize um uh, or, or or some like medically dangerous amount of alcohol um so so that's the prize up on offer and to enter all you got to do is donate using the link in the description uh or a super chat donations better than super chat because google takes 30 percent of super chats uh, so donate it in the description and the money will all go to UNICEF for the Yemen appeal, the Yemen crisis. So, uh, yeah. So let's go into the chapter. We're talking about Aya 6. Thank you all so much for joining. Thanks for all the super chats and donations. That's great. Uh, and let's begin. And again, like, this is a really fucking horrible dark chapter. This is Aya traveling to Harrenhal. She's been captured by the mountains men. And it's just all, all horror and trauma and, and war and dehumanization. It is mercifully short, so I think we should be able to get through it pretty quickly. And then we'll move on to something a bit more fun, which is Daenerys in Karth. So, let's begin. Um, fear cuts deeper than swords, Arya would tell herself, but that did not make the fear go away. So fear is what, is what is dehumanizing and what is destructive and what reduces a human to the level of an animal. Fear is what the soldiers use to grind the identity out of people and to make them into sheep. Um, they've got all these prisoners, all these small folk that they captured. I had been with Yorin, but then they were attacked by Armory Lorch and and um, and Lomi was killed and, and now she and Gendry and Hop High have been captured by the Mountains men and they're being taken to Harrenhal to be to be used as labor. Um, so I is feeling very afraid. Um, and fear is one like recurring theme in in a lot of the heroes' stories. Um, like Bran asks in his first chapter, like, you know, can a man be brave when he's afraid? And Ned says that that's the only time that a man can be brave is when he is afraid. And you've also got like in the first book, all, all the stuff about Sam being a coward, uh, and trying to overcome that cowardice by eventually like killing a white walker. Um, so, so it's overcoming fear and overcoming those obstacles that defines the character. It's going through that gauntlet of 
fear and, and suffering and opposition that that shapes the hero's heroism and, and, and their strength and their personality and their determination. Um, but God, it is a deep and, and dark hole that, that Arya has to travel through to get back out into the light. And she's still not back out into the light. You know, by by a face for crows. You know, she's she's murdering people in Bravos, and she still hasn't reclaimed her identity. She's still like this dehumanized killer defined by violence. So I, I think you know, probably more than anyone, um, really is is taken down deep in you know that like hero's journey that story circle when when a hero starts in a place that's normal and then they are empowered and then they are disempowered and they're brought low but then they rise back up and they face the challenge Aya goes as far down deep into the horror as anyone i think and she's still yet to re-emerge so they're traveling all these like peasants and all these random people are being like dragged to Harren Hall like chattel slaves and uh and they're only eating stale bread now technically that's a food description um we we always like to take note of food descriptions on alt shrift x because george martin likes nothing better than a stuffed capon and a greasy chin if you know what i mean um and usually these food descriptions are, in, in, are incredibly lavish all these like feasts that are happening in king's landing or like these hearty northern meals in winterfell and whatever but this stale bread has got to be the most it's the most restrained food description uh that i've ever seen in a song of ice and fire um and that has a purpose because it's showing us that while all of the lords and ladies and politicians are feasting and having this gorgeous food even through the war the stale bread is all that the common people have this is the vast majority of westeros this is the 99 percent uh, who are suffering under the lords and ladies and, and all of their luxuries and the, and the game of thrones that they are playing is at the expense of these pawns, these lowest pieces in the game. Um, and so it's a reminder that, you know, like we, we, we see the Starks as the good guys and like the Lannisters as the bad guys, but like to the peasants, they're all part of the same aristocratic machine that's just grinding them the fuck down through their unjust wars. Um... But we'll get to that more. So, yeah, Aya's feeling horribly afraid. She's feeling traumatized. And, and, you know, this is after her sort of, you know, empowerment. Like, Syria Pharrell taught her to fight and to be a water dancer. Um, but throughout um, throughout this chapter, she, she feels like she has lost that power. She feels as though she has lost that identity and that sense of strength and courage that she had. It's all stripped away by the sheer brutality of this march to Harren Hall. Uh, thanks so much for all of the donations and super chats, guys. Guys, it's really, it's really great to see that happening. It's all going to UNICEF, um, and it is better if you use the link in the description rather than the super chat feature on YouTube. Uh, but yeah, thanks so much. Uh, looks great, guys. Um, so they're marching to Harren Hall, and Gregor Clegane, the Mountain, is in command. And every day, well, well, previously, like before they left on this march, they were stuck in this storehouse in in, in the village by the God's Eye. And every day, the Mountain would pick one of the prisoners and take them for questioning. And they're, they're basically tortured to death. Like the tickler, this horrible torturer, the tickler makes them howl and makes them scream until they die. And the mountain just asks all these questions about where Beric Dondarrion is. But, like, the prisoners just... The prisoners don't know where Beric Dondarrion is. Beric is, like, this Batman-like Robin Hoodian uh, freedom fighter, this insurrectionist who's, like, trying to, you know, resist the Lannisters' occupation of the Riverlands. Um, and so the, the the Lannisters and the mountain is trying to track Beric down, but no one, no one, these peasants don't even seem to know where he is, or at least if some do, they're being drowned out by all the misinformation that's arising from their torture. Like all these peasants are just saying, you know, like whatever they have to say to stop being tortured, um, but it's all for nothing. Which, which does sort of raise that idea of like torture doesn't work like you you hear it said a lot that like torture just doesn't work it's pointless it only gets you false information because people will just say whatever to make it stop um i don't know how true that is like i'm sure there's experts who like know things i think personally like like you would not have to twist my nips very hard before i just told you the truth like if i if, if i actually knew something i feel like torture would be very effective on me uh not that that's like a suggestion or an invitation, but like I, I, I feel like torture. I, I mean, the torture doesn't work when you torture someone who doesn't know anything. Um, and I guess the 
tricky bit is figuring out whether someone knows something or not in the first place. I don't know. It doesn't really bear thinking about. But um, it, so this is a horrible scene. All these peasants are being tortured by the mountain. Um, and the women are being used and, and raped. Um, one girl shared a soldier's bed three nights running. The mountain picked her on the fourth day and she was tortured to death and the soldier said nothing. And even that, even that, just, that's just one sentence, this tiny little line of, of suffering, which I feel has so many just layers of, of horror packed into it. Like it shows how this woman is trying to survive by sleeping with this soldier um and you know she's she's tortured to death and then the soldier says says nothing which you know shows the 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 meaninglessness of that attachment and it, and it shows the futility of resistance and it shows the power that the mountain has over these men um that he can just take anything and kill anyone and and no one not even his own men can or will protest it's so fucking dark guys Let's try and get through this. Um, and it doesn't help if you're loyal. Like like one of the, a, a smiley old man uh, who mended their clothing and, and was trying to be friendly. And he was talking about how I'm super loyal to Joffrey. Like, you know, my son is is serving in the gold cloaks at King's Landing. I'm all for Joffrey. Super loyal. They called him all for Joffrey. And despite his total loyalty to the mountain's side, uh, he was picked and then he was tortured to death. So loyalty can't save you. Like, they say that this is a war, you know? They say that this is about, um, you know, the Lannisters versus the Starks and the Riverlanders and so on. And as long as you're on the right side and do the right thing, you'll be okay. But it's a lie. Like, you can be as loyal and serve as obediently as you like, and you're still at risk of being murdered by, by the war. Because the war is not one side or the other. It's just this giant monstrous machine that just grinds bone into dust that just uses people up um whoever wins the war the people lose you know that's what this is about and and i think that harren hall which is where we're going and where we're going to arrive at the end of the chapter is almost an embodiment of that harren hall is this castle the biggest castle in the world the largest military fortification installation in the land um, and it's this horror, it's this burned, you know, twisted, cracked, grotesque horror. It's like, it's like the homunculus of all warfare. It's like this psychic projection juddering into the real world, this protrusion from nightmares into reality, this giant stone embodiment of everything dark that comes from human hubris and, and power and dehumanization harren hall was 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 built by slave labor it was built by these riverlanders who were pressed into service of harren the black and forced to build this giant inhuman monument a monument to dehumanization to making humans less than human to be instruments and resources of building this abstract concept of human power this fucking bullshit ideal that a man can be more than a man if he subjugates other men that is what harren hall is and that is what Arya is being ground into this machine you know like fucking charlie chaplin modern modern what, what's it called the charlie chaplin movie where where he's like inside the machines and it's about like industrialization and, and machination and the way it grinds up a human being there's like that famous uh shot where charlie chaplin is being like extruded and sliding and winding through these like grinding gears that are like machinate and he's just being processed through it like a sausage through a fucking sausage grinder that's what that's what war is and that's what harren hall is and that's what all this all this shit is and so Aya is being sucked into that evil evil machine so people are being tortured uh it's real bad page two um and the mountain stands and watches while these people are being tortured to death he stands motionless watching and listening until the victim dies like a mountain right it, he, he is like a mountain in that he is huge he is still he is implacable he is merciless and he stands and he watches while people are tortured to death and of course the whole thing about like beric don darian being asked about um is is it's set up for Beric's eventual appearance in a storm of swords um we get a lot of like rumors about who Beric Dondarrion is and what he's up to before we finally meet him and we find that he's a goddamn 
disciple of the red god a resurrected fiery sworded hero who fights for the good guys but he's also not like entirely a good guy because like a lot of these peasants complain that like well yeah you know beric beric hasn't murdered anyone like like everyone else has but like he did steal my food he, he he did take he, take my food for his men and like he just gave me a piece of paper as payment that you know I'll probably never get compensation for so you know even Beric is not really that good of a guy um but we get lots of foreshadowing and mystery about who he is and of course we met Beric Tordarian in the first book at Game of Thrones um Sansa's friend Jane had a big crush on Beric Tordarian um and he was like this handsome, you know, chivalric, pretty knight who was sent off on a mission to arrest uh, Gregor Clegane, which, spoiler, didn't end very well. And that's how Beric ended up in the Brotherhood Without Banners and ended up being a fire zombie. So that's a, that's a whole thing. Um, so yeah, the, the mountain uh, is trying to track down Beric and he's torturing people, but it's not even effective at all. Like, he's just getting random misinformation by asking these peasants, um, which suggests that he's doing it more for his own pleasure than, you know, actually trying to get valuable, useful information. And Arya just feels horrible. Arya, feel, Arya knows that she's no water dancer. She's not a fighter like Sirio trained her. She's not strong. She doesn't feel like a Stark. She doesn't feel like a direwolf. She feels more like a lamb in a herd of sheep. She hates the villagers for being weak and sheepish, and she hates herself. I, I, let, let me remind you, I is like, what, nine years old? Ten years old at the moment? Uh, yeah, she's ten years old in book two. Um, and, she, and she hates herself because all of her strength and her pride has been stripped away. Um, she, the, the Lannisters had taken everything, her father, her friends, her home, her hope, her courage. They took Needle, which is like the symbol of her, like her strength and her ability for violence. And, and Needle represents Winterfell and Needle represents Jon in Arya's consciousness. So it's, it's so horrible that all that is taken away from her. They had even taken her secret, the secret that she's a girl. Cause like up till now, Arya has been pretending to be a boy, not a girl for her safety when traveling with Yorin. Um, but while she's marching, she's not able to, like, go off into the bushes to pee, so she's had to reveal that she's a girl. Um, and, and the worst part is that, like, no one, no one cares that she's a girl, after all. Like, the big secret, like, it's a big deal to her. Her secret, her identity, who she is, is revealed, and no one gives a shit, which is almost, like, more depressing than if people did care, you know? But, but, like, to these men... Gen her gender doesn't even matter. It's irrelevant. All she's just a tool. She's just an object. And her gender, her personality, her name, her preferences, her identity, whoever the fuck she is, doesn't matter. All she is is a body to be churned up in the machine of Harrenhal and to be used as labor and to be used as whatever's convenient at the time. It's dehumanizing, and that's the horror. Well, I mean, the dehumanization is horrible, but the violence is also horrible. We're told that there was a boy of three years old who kept calling for his, for his father, so the mountain's men smashed his face in with a spiked mace. And then the boy's mother started screaming, so Raph killed her as well. So they just- so people just have no value to these people. People- people can be killed out of hand, um, and it's horrible. Uh, and Raph the Sweetling, by the way, is of course the person who killed Lommy in Aya's previous chapter. Um, and Arya eventually gets revenge on Raph the Sweetling by murdering him in one of the preview chapters of The Winds of Winter. Um, so Arya no longer feels brave because there are no pe there are no brave people on the march, only scared and hungry ones. And it's only the women and young boys and old men who are on this march because all of the young men had been left chained to a gibbet and left for the wolves and the crows. So they, they fucking starved to death or were eaten alive, um, is, is the amount of respect the mountain has for human life. Uh, remember when Tywin said that, that, that people are just tools, like every tool has a purpose? This is, this is like the logic of that. Like, you know, when Tywin said it at the small council chamber that every man is a tool and every tool has a purpose, like that sounds like a semi-reasonable thing to say from the perspective of like the political tactical sphere of the small council. But then you see what it actually means to treat people as tools. And this is what that is. Because they, they say that they killed all the men except Gendry they kept alive because he's a smith and he can make cool helmets and stuff. And so therefore he was too valuable to kill. So it's people's like 
capacity to be useful to the war effort that determines their value as a human being. Every person is a tool, just like Tywin said. And so the small folk complain that this isn't just, this isn't right. Um, but but all of the, all of the houses have been treating them horribly. Like even the Tullys and the Starks came and took their food and took their stuff and used them for the war and conscripted them and did all sorts of bullshit. So like from our perspective, we think, yay Starks, yay Tullys, they're the good guys, and the Lannisters, ooh boo hiss, they're bad. But from the from the perspective of the peasants, all the houses are the goddamn same. They're all using them for the war. War is the evil, and feudalism is the evil. This is the logical consequence of feudalism. When when you have a system where some people are lesser and to be used by others, this is what you get. Um, and someone says, "Oh, you know, you know when things are really good was when when the old king was in charge." Um, and I was like, "Oh, old king Robert," and then the guy's like, "No, no, King Aerys, King Aerys Targaryen. He was great." Which for from us is like what? Like the Mad King was crazy and evil, right? The Mad King was terrible. How is how does that make any sense? Um, but from the from the perspective of the small folk, Ares might actually have been better for some people than the more recent lords. Like like a lot of Ares's madness that was a problem for Lord Stark and Lord Baratheon when Ares demanded the heads of Robert and Ned. Um, you know, Rhaegar Targaryen was 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 a problem for the Starks when you know Lyanna ran off with him and whatever. Uh, but from the perspective of the small folk, King Aerys might not have been that bad, you know? He was a shitty king, but at least he didn't, didn't go out and murder people actively. I mean, he did try and burn down King's Landing towards the end, but, you know, the small folk didn't know that. So, like, the small folk have a completely different perspective on the Game of Thrones. Like, the game looks very different from the perspective of a pawn than from a king and a queen, you know? Uh, so... They're taken on the march, along with all these captives, there are pigs, there are chickens, there's a milk cow, there's wagons of salt fish, and so the humans are just another resource, along with all those animals and all that food and stuff. Um, and yeah, there's more rape, uh, women are being used, women's bodies are treated as just another resource. Um, I is furious that Polliver, one of the mountain's men, has Needle, because Needle is her strength, Needle is her stark identity. And it'll be a long while before she gets that back. Um, and so while, while the prisoners are, are dehumanized and stripped of their personalities, the, the mountains men, the prisoners have to pay attention to who the mountains men are. Uh, you have to know who's lazy and who's cruel and who's smart and who's stupid. Um, because you need to know which of the mountains men are likely to hurt you and which of them are likely to give you extra food and which one. So, so like in order to survive, you've got to humanize and understand and, uh, the, 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 the captors while the prisoners, like, like, it's like the prisoners' personalities are being shaped and molded around the captors' personalities, you know, like some fucking Zimbardo prison experiment shit. Um, the psychology of captivity. Um, is what this is about. And Arya, meanwhile, all she does, all she can do is watch and listen and polish her hates. She hates Polliver for taking Needle. She hates Chiswick. She hates Raph, the sweetling who killed Lommy. She hates Armory Lorch for killing Yorin. She hates Meryn Trant for killing Sirio. She hates the Hound for killing Micah. She hates Sir Illan and Joffrey and the Queen for killing Ned. She hates, she hates all these people. All that she has left, the last, like, scrap of her personality that she holds close to her heart um, is her hatred for the people who have done her wrong and who have killed people. And she starts her prayer, her prayer of vengeance. Every night she whispers the names of the people that she, who have done her wrong and which she eventually wants to kill. Gregor, Dunson, Polliver, Chiswick, Raph, Tickler, Hound, blah, blah, blah. So this is the beginning of her prayer, which becomes, like, this last sort of dark kernel of, of this is what she clings on to, to to retain her humanity and her personality in the face of this horror is hatred and is death and um you got to ask like will that is that a good thing <laughs> like westeros will definitely be better off without these horrible men um and Arya will kill some of the people on on her list like uh, the tickler and you know polliver will die as well but, like, you know, what we see in some of the later books with Arya is that, you know, founding her identity on hatred and vengeance um, is just all the more dehumanizing. When she goes to the Faceless Men, that's about making her no one, about making her an instrument of death. Um, so my hope for Arya as a character is that she eventually sort of comes back to herself and to her identity as a Stark and manages to reject this 
obsession with vengeance, which is sort of what they did uh, in the TV show in season eight, where Arya went to kill Queen Cersei in the in, in the ruins of King's Landing, and and the Hound said, "No, no, 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 you don't want to be like me. You don't want to be defined by hate. You don't want to be defined by vengeance. Um, you want to go back home. Go back home to Winterfell. Be a Stark. Be 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 alive. Live. Don't hate." Uh, which I thought was like the one good part of season eight. I was like, that was like the one thing that I wasn't like specifically. Um, that was the one thing that wasn't like specifically uh, terrible in my mind was Arya's um, Arya's rejection of vengeance. So I hope that something similar will happen in the books because if Arya goes down the path of only being defined by vengeance and violence, I think it'll consume her. And then I think, as John said in book one, she'll say that. She'll say that Arya will be found when the winter snows thaw and she'll be found frozen in the snow with with a needle clutched tight between her frozen fingers. I think that is her fate if she follows death. So they're traveling along. They're going through this ruined, burned riverlands. These these burnt holdfasts thrust up from the dirt like rotten teeth. And they start to glimpse the towers of Harrenhal in the distance. Um, and some of the captives are hopeful that things will be better once they're in Harrenhal. They'll be safe once they're in Harrenhal. But Arya uh, presses X to doubt, because she heard old Nan's stories of the castle built on fear. Harren the Black had mixed human blood into the mortar uh, when he built Harrenhal, and then Aegon's dragons burned it down and roasted Harren and his sons, and the stone melted like candle wax and turned it into this grotesque, half-melted ruin that it is now. And I think that's really important, that line, human blood in the mortar. I think that's really, really specific. Um, I think that's really, really illustrative of what this chapter's about in terms of taking humanity, human blood, and and grinding it into a component of the war machine. Human blood in the mortar. That's like sort of what uh, George Martin's anti-war stance is all about, is that idea that, you know, taking the human and making it into part of this war machine is evil. Uh, thanks so much for the generous super chat from uh, Paranoid Altoid. Um who says a dollar per episode. Hey, can I get one true fact about you, however mundane? Um, mm, I'll think about that. Uh, continuing. So, Harren Hall, Harren the Black, melted down. I think it's like this physical embodiment of all this human evil and all the ways in which human beings can be subsumed into that evil is what Harren Hall represents. So, uh, Lord Tywin's army is encamped at Harrenhal. Um, they've got all these scorpions, like, built on the walls, all of these weapons, uh, to defend Harrenhal. And, and scorpions, of course, in the later seasons of the show were used as anti-dragon weaponry, remember? They killed, uh, they killed a dragon or two, they killed Rhaegal with, with scorpions. And I wonder if that's possible in the books. Like, if scorpions can kill dragons, and there's a whole bunch of scorpions on Harrenhal, I wonder if a dragon might die in the books at Harrenhal. Um, the, the trouble is that in the books, we the, we only see a dragon killed by a scorpion once, and that was uh, Meraxes, um, uh, Queen Rhaenys Targaryen's dragon. Uh, it was Rhaenys, wasn't it? Uh, and Meraxes got a scorpion bolt to the eye, which I think is meant to be a really lucky shot, you know? So I'm not sure if scorpions can kill fully grown dragons in the books canonically. And so they approach Harrenhal and the Lannister army and, uh, and, the, and, and, and Arya smells the stink of the latrines, the overflowing trenches full of shit. Uh, where these soldiers have been camping, which which I think is mentioned for a reason, because um, I think that, that that stink is used as a shorthand for moral rot, like something's very wrong, something's very corrupt, um, and that's why we smell the stink of the camp. It's like Lord Tywin's corpse, you know, like when when Tywin dies in in a storm of swords it, at a feast for crows, I talk about how his how his corpse stinks to high heaven, and I think that represents partly. Uh, the horror and the corruption and the emptiness uh, or, and how disgusting Tywin Lannister's legacy is as such a murderous, criminal, horrible person who, who ordered so many deaths and so much horror. And I think that the stink of Tywin's army here um, is sort of a continuation of that symbol. 
Uh, thanks so much for the generous donation from Christine as well, who says, all your channels bring me so much joy. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Um, thank you so much for all these donations and stuff, guys. It's all going to UNICEF, so it's a good cause. Thanks, guys. Um, and so they're approaching Harren Hall, and Harren Hall looks like some old man's gnarled knuckly fingers groping after a passing cloud which sort of symbolically is what it is right i mean harren hall was harren the black grasping for the sky grasping for power like icarus and getting burned as a result you know icarus tried to fly up to the sky uh, and he got burned out of his hubris and his ambition harren hall is the same harren tried to build the largest castle in the world be this tyrant who'd live forever and and he was burned for it so I think Harren Hall is like the embodiment of the horror of human ambition, the horror of human hubris when it's used to subjugate others. There's blood in the mortar, you know? Uh, so Hot Pie is scared of Harren Hall. He says there's ghosts in there. But Chiswick says, well, you got to join the ghosts or you'll be one. you got to come inside or we'll kill you. And so they enter Harren Hall and these two fierce old women... Uh, they run the indoctrination process because the first thing that happens is that they have to scrub and scrape themselves in scalding hot water which is always the first step in indoctrinating people you scrub away all that's external and all that's visible until there's just human meat beneath uh, the the fierce old women discuss them as bluntly as if they were newly acquired donkeys the humans are very directly being treated like animals like chattel um, and they see the calluses on Aya's fingers, and those calluses come from Aya's practice with a needle. So this is from Aya, this is a sign of Aya's strength and her identity and her opposition to the Lannisters. But the women look at it and say, oh, well, I bet you got those calluses from churning butter. So, uh, I guess you're some farmer's whelp, so we're going to send you to the kitchens. And, you know, it, it, it's almost more depressing than if they, like, accurately recognized... Aya is a threat, you know? It would be more humanizing if they saw Aya as, like, an opposition, but no, they just see her as just another farmer's whelp, just another, just, just another resource among many other just like her. Uh, and so they tell her that you, you go into the kitchen, um, and Aya says, oh, I'd rather go to the stables, because um, she's like, oh, maybe if I can get into the stables, I might be able to steal a horse and escape Harren Hall. Uh, and so the woman slaps Aya so hard that her swollen lip breaks open, and she says, keep your tongue to yourself. No one asks your views. And she's like, oh, well, you know, the kitchens are really snug and warm and great. And you could have done really well there. But since you're not a clever girl, uh, we're going to give you to Weiss instead. So this horrible, like, sociopathic woman, as punishment for Arya speaking out of turn, uh, she decides to send Arya to the cruel and sadistic Weiss instead of the warm, comfortable kitchens. So these women are really enjoying tormenting these people. And I suppose, among other things, it's a reminder that it, it isn't just evil men who are responsible for the horror of this war. There's also women who are complicit in the evil. Um, all kinds of people become part of this oppressive machine. Um, so Aya is having a really bad time, uh, and they give her to Weiss. So, Weiss uh, is one of the understewards who manages the people at Harren Hall, uh, and he says, oh, you know, the Lannisters are generous to people who serve them well, and if you work hard, then you'll rise as high as me, if, if you're lucky, uh, but, you know, I will not accept any defiance. My nose can smell pride, it can smell disobedience, and if I catch a whiff, you'll answer for it. When I sniff you, all I want to smell is fear. So, they are very, very deliberately, very explicitly trying to grind these people down into just husks of themselves, into nothing more than obedient, dutiful slaves to be used for labor in the war machine, blood in the mortar of Harren Hall. Um, it's super horrible, and this is all part, of course, of Arya's character arc, which is about her identity being stripped away from her, radicalizing her into this faceless assassin with the faceless men, um, and I hope that the other end of that character arc will, her be, will be her emerging from that dehumanization and emerging from that horror with a newfound commitment and humanity and identity to herself as a Stark, is what I hope will happen, but there's a long, dark 
winter before we get that dream of spring, I think, and there's many more horrors for Arya before the dawn. God, that's a pretty sexy line to end it on. Um, maybe we should end it there. I think I have a few other things to say. Um, I mean, like, obviously this is like, this is George Martin banging the anti-war drum. George Martin was a conscientious objector to the Vietnam War. Um, and I think that shows through in this chapter. Um, this is A Song of Ice and Fire, as much as it's all about war, is very much about the horror of war and the, and the evil of war. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's interesting, you know, like Weiss says, the Lannisters are generous to those who serve them well. Um, which is so much bullshit because at the start of the chapter we saw how all for Joffrey, the guy who was super loyal to the Lannisters, got tortured to death. So it's a lie. Like, they tell you that, oh, all you have to do is work hard and be obedient and you'll be okay. It's a lie. Everyone can be swallowed up. Anyone can be killed. No one's life is sacred. So that's the horror of this situation. And I think, you know, that's that's about, like, you're not just breaking someone's personality, taking away someone's possessions, taking away someone's relationships, taking away someone's safety. You're also taking away someone's brain. Because when you, like, indoctrinate them with, like, you know if you're loyal, you'll survive. That's a lie, but you have to believe that lie. Like, that's what doublethink is, you know? It's about breaking your brain as well as your identity, forcing you to believe lies. Like, the beneficence of the generous Lannisters is part of how they break you down. Okay, we're going to do another chapter. We're going to do another chapter, um, because that was just so dark and horrible. Jesus Christ. Like, I don't want that to be the tone of this 100th episode. So I think we'll just, we'll do a double feature. We're going to roll right into episode 101 and we're going to go to the other side of the world of Ice and Fire. We're going to do uh, Daenerys 2, A Clash of Kings, the 28th chapter in book two. And this is where Daenerys explores Karth. Um, so I think we're just going to jump straight into that. Oh, we got a different picture. I got a picture ready. So there we, all right, we're in Karth. Whew, did you feel that? Kacham! We've just teleported to Karth, and I'm so happy to say that the tone is going to be so much more fun. Like this chap, like this Aya chapter was just this dark trudge through horror and torture, and all that. Change the page, change the vibe. I want you to stand up, wiggle your arms around, do a star jump. Uh, forget what we all just did. We're going to do a fresh, new, exciting chapter. Great. Um, and thanks, uh, thanks so much for all the super chats that are rolling in, guys. And again, like, it's better to donate using the link in the description, because uh, that way 30% more money gets to UNICEF. Uh, and uh, and everyone who donates goes into the running to win a prize. I haven't even talked about the prize. I, f I forgot to talk about the prize. All right, on screen, this is what the prize is, okay? That is the box of stuff that you can win if you donate uh, at the link below. Uh, it's a big box full of A Song of Ice and Fire and Game of Thrones merchandise, and it has in it uh, three little plush direwolves. I think it's Ghost and Summer and Nymeria, little little plush toys, super cute. Uh, there's a couple of Funko Pops. Uh, there's a set of A Song of Ice and Fire tarot cards illustrated by an artist um, that are really, really cool. Um, and and mo like a lot of the stuff you can't get anywhere. Most of the stuff is like not for sale. This is like some exclusive limited edition sort of shit. Um, there's a cloth map of King's Landing, there's some Christmas lights, there's some of those uh, miniatures, like Dark Sword, you know, little uh, Song of Ice and Fire Warhammer things, there's Shire Post coins, badges, Mace's Journal, and like a bunch of other, like there's a Rubik's Cube in there for some reason. There's, there's, like, there's like 20 things in this box that you can't get anywhere else, and it all can be yours if you donate at the link below. Um, we're gonna choose the winner at the end of this live stream, so you gotta do it now. Um, we'll select a random winner. Uh, let, actually, let's see how much we've raised so far. Um, 600 bucks. We've got 600 bucks for charity so far, guys. So, that's great. Um, alright, so let's go to Calf. Let's do it. This is the, I think this is the first double feature we've done. So, um, let's just fucking do it. So, Daenerys 2. Uh, so, alright, Daenerys recap. So, in the previous book. Daenerys was sold to Drogo, hung out with the Dothraki, fell in love with Drogo, Drogo died, she, she had a baby, baby died, uh, had a big fire, Miri Mazda burned, 
dragons rose from it. The first dragons in, in many, many years. And um, Daenerys then, at the start of book two, walked through the desert like like Jesus or someone. Very religious imagery, following the red comet, the star above. She becomes like this messianic figure leading her, her people, the Dothraki, through the wastes to try and find salvation and, and um, safety. So she's finally arrived at Karth and she was greeted by three seekers who came seeking dragons. There was uh, Zarazo and Daxos, and Quaith, and the warlock Piat Pri. Uh, and so they have brought her into Karth, and she's going to see the wonders and the glories of the greatest city in the world. So this is like... It, it, if last chapter was like a grayscale slog through the mud and the blood, this chapter is a kaleidoscope of color and fantasy and and bewitching enchanting entrancing flavors like that's what this this chapter is an explosion of color which contrasts so hard with the, with the previous horror um as soon as we step into Karth uh there are these there are these camel riders who who ride out to be Daenerys's honor guards um, and the riders wear copper armor, with, and, and the camels have copper tusks and black silk plumes, and saddles inlaid with rubies and garnets, and the camels are dressed in blankets of a hundred different hues. This explosion of color, right at the start. Um, and, and, and I'm imagining that must be a bit warm, if you're a camel. Like, this is the desert, like, Karth is in the middle of the red waste. Um, and I imagine that being dressed in blankets when you're in the desert must be pretty uncomfortable. I hope that the camels have a bit of air conditioning in their blankets. You know, I hope that the, I hope that the camel's got a little, little fan, little, you, you know, those little fan, you know, you can get like a little hat that's got a little battery powered fan that just blows sweet cold air in your face. I hope the camel's got a little one of those just in his face so he can stay all comfy when he's in the desert. Because, like, you know, I'll do a lot of crazy things for fashion. I'm willing to be uncomfortable for fashion. But wearing these blankets of a hundred different hues in the desert, I mean, goddamn, that is some commitment. That is some dedication to stoil that I uh, am impressed to see in a camel. Uh, second paragraph, Piat Pri declares that Karth is the greatest city that ever was or ever will be. Which is like, well, you know, it is, it is, it is rich. It's clearly a rich city. Uh, and it's an ancient city, uh, no doubt. Uh, we don't actually know all that much about the history of Karth because uh, there's no chapter about it in the World of Ice and Fire. The World of Ice and Fire is the world book that has all these descriptions of, um, of all the different places in the World of Ice and Fire and their histories. It talks all about Yi Ti, and it talks all about Ashai, and it talks all about the Bones, and it talks all about Volantis and the Free Cities. It doesn't have a section on Karth. We learn like a little bit, but not much, which I, I, I think the reason for it is that George Martin figured he didn't need a section on Karth because he, t he tells us so much about Karth in this and other chapters in this book. It's the same with Marine. There's no like Marine chapter in the World of Ice and Fire. Um, so I think that's just because he feels he doesn't need to repeat himself after the main series. But other people speculate that maybe, ooh, there's secrets in the history of Karth that might be relevant um, to the end game of the series. Which, you know, I press X to doubt personally, but um, yeah. Um, thanks so much for all the donations rolling in, guys. Thanks for Jack V, who says uh, Euron equals Dario. Uh, it's true. Confirmed. Um... And so Piat Pri says, that, oh, yeah, Quaith is so great. Um, and, and I think that, you know, I mean, basically the point of the, of the Karth arc is that we realize that, you know, Karth, for all the talk, for all the color, for all the majesty, it's basically hollow. It's basically corrupt. It's basically empty. Like, we see that in the House of the Undying, when Daenerys gets taken into this trippy funhouse mirror of bullshit. And she just learns that it's all lies. It's all illusions. It's like Wizard of Oz. You know, you pull back the curtain and there's just some desiccated old man who, who doesn't really know what he's doing and hasn't been taking his medication. Like, it's not... Karth is a lie. Um, but the lie is all they've got. The appearance is all they've got. So Piat Pri and all these Karthine are constantly talking up the majesty and the glory and the wonders. They don't deliver on any of their promises. There's no follow through with these assholes, um, but it's all about that image. It's all about that fucking swag. Um, uh, so Daenerys is kind of skeptical, but you know she has to admit this is a magnificent city. There are three thick walls encircling Karth that are elaborately carved. 
The outer wall is decorated with animals. The middle wall is decorated with scenes of war. And the inner wall is decorated with scenes of sex that make Daenerys blush. Because um, that really is like the three things that are that are great, really. Animals, war, and sex. Like, what more do you need? That's basically all that, um, that Reddit is. <laughs> Those are the three categories of subreddits. <laughs> It's 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 all the cute animals subreddits and and then war like I don't know I guess that's like video game subreddits and then there's sex which is every other subreddit that's basically like the Maslow's hierarchy of like fucking nerd interests that's what Karth is a monument to it's things that George Martin liked when he was in the seventies psychedelics it's it's a big psychedelic this is this is a psychedelic journey into the mind of george martin because like all, like all the drug use stuff all the hippie shit like i don't know if george, i don't know how much george was into that stuff but this is a very psychedelic chapter and like that becomes a lot more explicit in um the house of the undying uh which is when which is when daenerys explicitly takes drugs and trips the fuck out but like this whole chapter is like kaleidoscopic and psychedelic and trippy and everything that's happening is this entrancing kaleidoscope um and what, what am i saying i'm saying that there's just a journey into the mind of like things that george thinks is cool um because he, he loves he loves his sources and he loves his battles uh, and he loves his fat pink masts so that's why i think the walls of karth have animals war and sex um someone in the chat asks when does the donation window close you can donate to unicef at any time if you're listening to this after the live stream you can you can you can donate to unicef now and i encourage you to do so but if you want to enter the running to win the uh the incredible exclusive exciting uh prize box full of a song of ice and fire merch uh you've got to donate like now like during the live stream we're going to announce the winner at the end of the live stream okay uh so they're in Carth. there's cool walls page two all the colors that have been missing from Vase to Loro had found their way to Karth. Uh, buildings crowded about her, fantastical as a fever dream, in shades of rose, violet, and umber. There were there statues of snakes de decorated with flakes of jade, obsidian, and lapis lazuli. There are fountains wrought in the shapes of griffins and dragons and manticores. Like, it's so trippy. Um... And, and, and the outer gates uh, are, are banded with copper, the middle gates with iron, and the innermost with golden eyes, which is interesting. D don't the children of the forest have golden eyes, usually? But also just like whenever I see eyes anywhere, I just think of Bloodraven and his thousand eyes. But in the context of Karth, I think about Quaith. Quaith seems to be watching Daenerys somehow. Uh, and Shiera Seastar, I then wonder about. Is Shiera connected to Quaith? Is Bloodraven connected to Shiera? All sorts of mysteries, which don't really get resolved at all, so maybe they don't actually lead anywhere. Um, Karth kind of seems like a massive distraction in, in the whole sort of arc of the story. Like, like that's sort of the in-universe point of Karth, is that, like, um, Daenerys realizes that it's all just like a hollow fantasy and she needs to leave Karth. Like, it, Karth looks appealing on the surface, but is empty and pointless within. That's kind of how I feel about the Karth storyline as a reader. Doesn't really go anywhere. I have read speculation. I have heard theories um, that the whole point, the whole reason why the Karth storyline exists is that George Martin was writing the Westeros plotline and writing the Essos plotline, and he originally was planning for A Song of Ice and Fire to be a trilogy, right? It was meant to be book one, um kicks off the story and, like, starts the War of the Five Kings. And then, like, book two, Daenerys invades Westeros. And then book three, the White Walkers are defeated in the Battle for the Dawn. Like, like that seems to have been the initial point of... Um, that, that was the initial plan. But then things got a little bit more complicated than Georgie Porgy expected. And so he got he went on this sort of all these rabbit holes with the War of the Five Kings. And then, ooh, what if Lady Stoneheart? And ooh, what if Beric Dondarrion? And ooh, you know. And things just rapidly spiraled out of his control. Um, all these new things were happening in Westeros, is my point. And so he had all these extra storylines to feed in about Westeros. But then he's like, well, what do I do with Daenerys? Like, while all of this extra stuff is happening, um, why, what do I do with Daenerys this whole time? And so I've heard that that might be why the whole Karth plotline exists, is just to keep Daenerys busy while the Clash of Kings and Storm of Swords stuff happens in Westeros. 
That sounds like something that George would have to do. Like, George, despite the intricacy and the beauty uh, and the depth of A Song of Ice and Fire, George really, like, some of it is really held together with, like, fucking shoestring and, and, and masking tape, you know? And you can sort of see the cracks in Karth sometimes, I think. Anyway, so it's this elaborate, beautiful fantasy fever dream. Uh, the Karthine are tall, pale folk in linen and samite and tiger fur. Uh, and the women wear gowns that leave one bare breast, while the men wear beaded silk skirts. I- I've got questions about, like, the one bare breast thing. Um, like, do, do you think that the women, do you think they alternate which boob is hanging out each day? Because, like, if you had only, like, the same boob out every day, like, it'd probably get a bit sunburned or tanned, right? Or, like, maybe that's the fashion. Like, like maybe, like, the half and half tan is sort of, like, what they're going for. But, like, you know, you're essentially making yourself into a kebab if you've got, like, you know, like, like when you're, when you're, like, got a rotisserie chicken, you want to rotate so that all sides get equally exposed to the sun. That's why I think that having one boob out all the time uh, would maybe be bad. You don't want to be cooked asymmetrically. You always want to be cooked symmetrically. So if I was wearing a gown with one boob out at a time, I would definitely alternate. I would definitely alternate the titties, um, is the strategy I would use. Um, but you know, maybe, maybe you just have like a favorite, like lefty or righty. And so that's why you, um, maybe you have your favorite out on display. Like maybe one boob is better than the other. So you want to show off your best boob. Um, or maybe you want to be your best boob, uh, like, you know, concealed and protected beneath the gown and your least favorite boob is on display. So that only your favorite folks and your lovers get to see your prettiest boob. Um, that's what I do. I only show my favorite boob to someone who I really like. Um, I imagine that would be really like with no, like, like, you know, there's no support to a boob that's just hanging out there. I feel like that would be really uncomfortable depending on how your anatomy is. Um, you wouldn't want to have like, you know, because you can't fit a sports bra. All right, moving on. Um, so Daenerys is looking at all of these incredible, colorful, crazy, one-boobed people. Um, and Daenerys thinks, oh, we must look really savage to these to these Carthine. Because, you know, she's just been walking through the desert with the Dothraki you know, wiping her bum on sand for, like, months. Like, this is a big change in circumstances for Daenerys, is my point. Um, And there's all these thousand colored birds and trees and flowers blooming on the terraced walls, which makes me wonder, like, how how are they growing all these flowers and these plants out in the desert, right? Like, this is the middle of the red waste. How How do they have the capacity to grow all this stuff? It's like growing lemons in Bravos, am I right? Um, I wonder if they're using some kind of magic. Because, you know, this is Karth. This is a city of sorcerers and warlocks. And the warlocks, you know, weren't very powerful until the the dragons were born again. But I wonder if... Because, you know, it's all about, like, the, the fakeness and the artifice. So I wonder if these dragons are kind of fake. You know, I wonder if the, oh, these these plants and these flowers are kind of fake. I wonder if there's some kind of falsity to them. Like, it's, it's all, it, it reminds me of, like, Disneyland. Like, like, you walk down Disneyland and, like, everything looks so lush and expansive and colorful and you want to buy a little Mickey Mouse pen for fourteen ninety nine USD. Um, but then you sort of, like, go behind the scenes and you, and you peek through the corners and, like, you go through the secret employee tunnels and you start to realize that, you know, it's... It's fake. It's like a Hollywood set, you know. It's 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 thin. It's hollow. It's it's everything that's fancy is pointing at you, and all the you know ugly stuff is 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 sort of tucked away. Like Carth is like a theme park of a city, and Daenerys is sort of going on some rides and you know seeing some sights. But pretty soon she's going to realize that oh boy, they're really just trying to just trying to s- squeeze some rubles out of me. They're just trying to get me to spend fourteen ninety nine on a fucking schmickle snack, and, like, that's just not worth it, even if it do- has got Goofy the dog's face on it, you know? Uh, yeah, it's real Disneyland in the desert, which is what Disneyland is. <laughs> fucking Anaheim, California, come on. Yeah, d- d- Just Jay in the live chat compares it to Dubai. Dubai is a crazy fucking city that is that is luxurious and and gigantic and hubristic and you know wants to be a great city and it's and it's this sort of just hollow place in the middle of the desert um which which yeah which involves which is questionable um maybe dubai is like the carth of the real world anyway so all of the these seekers zaro and piatpri and quaith uh well 
Zaro and Piat Bree mostly are just relentlessly sucking up to Daenerys, just saying, oh, if you want anything, I'll give it to you. The city is yours. Everything, you can drink of truth and wisdom. I'll give you sunlight and sweet water and silks to sleep in. We'll put a crown upon your head. And, and, and they're trying to suck up to her because she has dragons. And they're trying to, like, get the dragons for status and, and power and so on. So it's it's everything coming out of these guys' mouths is bullshit. Um, and Daenerys is trying to stay focused. She's trying to keep her eyes on the prize. She says that the only palace that I want is the castle at King's Landing. I don't I don't need any of this other crap. I don't need your crown. I just I just I just want the red castle at King's Landing. So she she's remembered the lesson that she learned from Miri Mazdur, um, the witch who who killed her unborn child in the previous book. So she's wary of magicians. She's wary of all of these guys. Um, which, which is sort of why, like, sort of the 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 Karth arc seems a little bit redundant. Like, like, what does Daenerys learn from Karth? She learns that, like, not to trust fucking sorcerers with blue lips, right? But that's what she learned last last book when when she learned not to trust Miri Mazdur. You know, like, I, I, like da- Daenerys is like takeaway from Karth is not terribly clear to me. So I'm not really sure what the point of this arc is in some ways. Um, uh, a warlock's house is built of bones and lies, uh, Zara Zoan Daxos says. So, the, so, the, so, so, you know, Zaro and Piat are trying to discredit each other at the same time as they're trying to uh, suck up to Daenerys. Uh, and Zara says, "Well, you know, the warlocks—they used to be mighty, but now they're, but now they, they just read crumbling scrolls and drink shade of the evening and hint of dread powers. But they are hollow husks compared to those that went before." Uh, and Jorah says, oh, the crow calls the raven black. He's saying that Zaru is the same. So you get the sense that Karth, like, might have been great once, but it's kind of empty and hollow and pointless now. And all it has are boasts. All it has is bragging about what it used to be. And it's, like, superficial baubles and it's superficial, you know, pleasures and luxuries. There's, there's no substance here. Nor is there any substance to the promises made to Daenerys. It's all bullshit. Um... But the whole, like, you know, warlocks having no power thing uh, does change because the birth of Daenerys' dragons do seem to spark a, a return of magic to the world. Um, so it's... So the warlock's powers also increase. And, you know, there's the whole thing because, like, you know, like Daenerys goes to the House of the Undying and she, like, burns the heart that makes them immortal or whatever. So the warlocks go after Daenerys for revenge. Like, in the official World of Ice and Fire app, is where it's revealed that, like, the, the Warlocks went after Daenerys, uh, and then Euron Greyjoy intercepted the Warlocks and captured them and took the Dragonbinder horn from them, which is interesting. The the, the Warlocks of Karth had a Valyrian Dragonbinding horn. Weird. Um, and then uh, Euron cut the legs off Piat Pri and hung him from the rafters of his ship, so, you know, that revenge plan didn't work too well. But anyway, so, like, you know, Daenerys, like, Jorah is saying you shouldn't trust these guys. And Daenerys is like, well, you know, these guys are powerful. Like, I want them to help me get my crown. Um, but Jorah's like, nah, I don't even like this. I don't like the smell of this place. Which, again, like, that's just like what we were saying in the last chapter about, like, the stink of Lord Tywin's army latrines is a sign of the corruption of of his whole his whole war and his whole politics and his whole position and um and the stink of Karth is is true of that as well. And Daenerys is like, oh well, you know, it smells sweet to me, but Jorah says that sweet smells are sometimes used to cover foul ones. Which 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 is exactly what someone who stinks would say. <laughs> <laughs> in in Daenerys' defense. Jorah, you know, he's a hairy bear who's been who's just spent a month walking through the desert. I don't know how much uh, Axe body spray Jorah had access to while he was walking through the Red Waste, but if you had to ask me, uh, I suspect you could smell Jorah's armpit from low Earth orbit. Uh, I imagine that Jorah is a is a is a odiferous dude um, at this point. And so, you know, a foul-smelling man would be the kind of person to tell you not to trust sweet smells, <laughs> is what I'm thinking. Um, a- Aof in the live chat asks a great question, which is, if the Warlocks of Karth had a dragon-binding horn this whole time, why didn't they use it? That is a great question. Uh, that is a great question. Like, if the Warlocks wanted Daenerys' dragons, why didn't they just blow the dragon-binding horn and take them? 
That's a great question. Maybe maybe at the time they didn't have a dragon binding horn. Maybe they only got the horn like afterwards, specifically to use on Daenerys after she had left. Or maybe the dragon horn doesn't work in quite the way that we think. Um, like, you know, Macquaro and Euron and Victarion seem to think that blowing the horn gives you control of the dragons, but maybe it's a bit more complicated than that. Maybe there's like a, there's like a, you know, sacrifice or some mistranslation or I, I don't know what's going on with the dragon horns. Anyway, um, so she's going to Karth and, and, you know, this, this, yeah, so this arc is sort of about disillusion. Like Danny sort of wants to believe that these people will help her, but yeah, they won't. Um, and Daenerys thinks that, ah, oh, Jorah, my, my great bear. I am his queen, but I will always be his cub. He will always guard me. It makes her feel safe. She wished she could love him better than she did. Which is a bit like, all right, well, hang on, Daenerys. Like, why are you being so blindly trusting of Jorah here? Like, she, like, he kissed you a while ago. Um, and he has, like, pretty much straight up admitted that he's, like, attracted to her because she looks like his ex-wife, Laness Hightower. Um... I don't know if Daenerys should be, like, as affectionate and as trusting of Jorah as she is. But, like, you know, Jor- Jorah is the guy who's been by her side for, like, a whole book now. So, I guess he's the best she's got, even though he is kind of, like, creepy and possessive and manipulative. Like, later on, she's saying, like, oh, Jorah, I want you to go down to the docks and, like, talk to some people and, like, get some intel. And Jorah's like, no, I have to stay by your side. Which is like, oh, he's being protective, but he's also being possessive. Jorah doesn't want anyone but him to be by her side all the time. He's a controlling uh, dude. Um, and 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 he's not as, as pretty as he is in the show, which is which I think is, like... Um, like, one of the issues with the show is that, like, pretty much everyone on the TV show is, like, a, you know, above-average attractiveness. Like, they're all, they're all around that, you know, uh, 8 out of 10 sort of ballpark. Whereas in the books, like, you know... There's a lot of 5 out of 10s. There's, there's some 10 out of 10s. There's some 2 out of 10s. There's a lot more variation in, like, how attractive people are in the books. Whereas in the show, everyone just looks like a Hollywood actor because they're all Hollywood actors, you know? Like, it's this sort of narrowing of the of the windows of, like, you know, what people look like. Which sucks. Like, it's, it's less... Like, because it's part of their personalities. Like, it matters. Because, you know, how people look affects how they're treated. And how they're perceived. Um, and so making Jorah into like handsome Ian McWatsy's name uh, in the show does sort of change the context and the vibe of Jorah as a character, for better or for worse. Uh, Ian Glenn. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, Joanna in the live chat says it better than I did. Ian Glenn really masked how odious Jorah is. Yeah, I, I think when Jorah is uglier, it's easier to see that he is a bad person. And of course, like, you know, I've talked about that before on this stream, is like, you know, it's really unfair that, like, you know, gross-looking people... Like, like in the books, like, I think something that George Martin does sometimes is that he makes, like, bad people, morally repugnant people, ugly, as though, like, ugliness correlates with being a bad person, which I think is obviously, like, a horrible thing to believe about, you know, the real world. Just because someone's ugly doesn't mean they're a horrible person. Um... But it is it is something in fiction that communicates ideas, and so it's interesting that you know by making Jorah pretty, his affections and his moves on Daenerys in the show uh, seem more welcome um, than they would in the books, which is yeah interesting. Yeah, and Doozy in the live chat points out Tyrion Lannister as well. Yeah, because fucking Peter Dinklage in the show, he's hot. And that totally changes um, his character because, like, part of the reason why Tyrion is so mistreated and so shit on is because he's a twisted, ugly dwarf with different colored eyes and a giant protruding forehead and different colored hair. He's this chimeric, twisted monster, and so people treat him as such. Um, and so, yeah, the appearance matters. And then Joanna also says that, yeah, Cersei is gorgeous and horrible. Yeah, so there are beautiful people who are horrible in A Song of Ice and Fire as well. And yeah, that's that's a definite, deliberate thing. Um, but I, I think he also, like a lot of the minor characters, he also has a tendency to make, like, gross people ugly, which I think is kind of lame. But um, I don't know, it's all interesting. Um, so Zara, Zara, Zoe, and Daxos hosts Daenerys, lets, lets her stay on his couch in his Airbnb. Uh, and his his pad is a palace that's larger than many market towns. It's an enormous mansion. Uh, Daenerys gets an entire wing of the mansion, which includes her own gardens, a marvel a mar- a marble bathing pool, a scrying tower, and a warlock's maze. 
which sounds interesting. What exactly is a warlock's maze? Is it just like a hedge maze? Like a little fun maze to scamper around in? Or is it magical? Like, what's the point of a warlock's maze if it's not actually magical? Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, it, when, when Daenerys enters the House of the Undying, it, it, it seems like a magical maze. Because she, like, you know, she goes through the door on the left, like, five times, and, like, it's, it, it's impossible geometry. Maybe the warlock's maze in this mansion also has impossible, um, impossible geometry. Um, like some sort of Escher, Mobius strip sort of shit. That'd be cool. That'd be a cool little thing to have in your house. Um, Zarazo and Daxos, um, he's an elegant man with a bald head and a great beak of a nose crusted with rubies, opals, and flakes of jade, which I feel like would be very uncomfortable. Like, imagine if you sneeze... <laughs> Imagine if you sneeze and then just this blast of, like, rubies, opals, and flakes of jade just hit the person in front of you, like a shotgun blast. You, you, you know, like, um, there's, like, there's, like, weird YouTube channels where, like, gun enthusiasts just do weird things with guns, like, they load a shotgun with, like, gummy bears as ammunition. Um, and, it, and isn't that, uh, isn't that, isn't it a thing that, like, people load shotguns with, like, salt? Or something, or, uh, and then you shoot someone with rock salt, and it's this really like just horrible, unethical. I mean, I don't think there's anything ethical to shoot people with, except maybe gummy bears. But my point is that you put like just little you know, like rocks of shit in a shotgun and sh shoot people with them. That's what I imagine. That's what happens when you sneeze when you've got a nose full of r rubies and opals. <laughs> you just blast someone with precious stones. If I had to be blasted, I'd rather be blasted with some rubies. You know what I'm saying? Not diamonds, though. They're a bit too hard. I don't want them going through me. Um, all the great of Karth will come to see my dragons, Daenerys thought. And so she, everyone wants her attention since she's the dragon lady. Uh, and then Piat Pri departs and he, said, and he kisses her bare feet with pale blue lips. And he presses on her a gift, a jar of ointment that he swears will let her see the spirits of the air. Which is definitely drugs, right? Like, that's some fucking shroom juice for sure. A, a, an ointment that lets you see the spirits of the air. The, the, the warlocks are just fucking ultra psychedelic stoners. They just, they just want to go on drug trips all the time. Um, which is what magic is, after all. But then the last to depart is Quaith. Quaith the Shadowbinder from Ashai. And Quaith, she's not like the others. She doesn't, like, suck up to Daenerys so much. She doesn't give her all these gifts, but she does give a warning. She says, beware. They will come day and night to see the wonder of the dragons, and when they see, they shall lust, for dragons are fire made flesh, and fire is power. So, when you got power, when you got swag, everyone wants a piece of it. That's what's going on here, and Quaith is warning her. Um... Which sort of makes you wonder what Quaith wants, huh? You know? Like, Quaith continues to appear to Daenerys throughout the book and throughout the following books. And she just sort of gives these weird cryptic visions and, and prophecies and things. And Daenerys, like, fully believes in her prophetic destiny. Like, later she says that, you know, The bleeding star led me to Quaith for a purpose. Here I will find what I need. The gods will send me a sign. So, like... Daenerys has really, like, drunk her own Kool-Aid. Like, she really does think that she's got a... She's on a mission from God, as they say in, um, the Blues Brothers. Um, so... So she really... She really... I guess that's that's her attraction to Quaith. Because Quaith feels like she is a channel and a window into her magical destiny. And maybe she is. But maybe also Quaith has her own machinations and her own goals. Like, Quaith seems to have a glass candle. Like, presumably that's how she appears in Daenerys' dreams. Because Marwyn says that a glass candle lets you appear in people's dreams. And so if Quaith has a glass candle, and if Marwyn has a glass candle, you got to wonder if Quaith and Marwyn are incommunicado. Because when Quaith warns Daenerys of all these different people, the sun's son and the and the perfumed seneschal and, and the, or the lion and, and all those people, Quaith neglects to mention Marwyn. Um, Quaith mentions all these different people who are heading for Daenerys. She does not mention Marwyn, who happens to be the one other person who we know has a glass candle. So you've got to wonder, are Daenerys, are, are Quaith and Marwyn in cahoots? I think they might be. Um... So, yeah, so Daenerys is trying to be skeptical. She's trying to remember the treachery of Miri Mazdur, but she's also trying to, like... She's also sort of suckered in by the promise and the glory and the magnificence of Karth. So she's she's 
uh, going to be disillusioned gradually. She tells uh, Rakuro to go and look at Karth and to take some women with him to go to places where men are forbidden. She tries to gather some intel. And we never hear what Rakuro found. I think George Martin might have just <laughs> straight up forgotten about that. Um, and then she asks Jorah to go look for news at the docks. Um, and then she bathes in the marble pool and the water is deliciously cool, which like, you, you know, when like you drink water after it's been a long time since you've drunk water, like you're really thirsty. There's no better feeling than drinking water when you're really thirsty. Daenerys has been walking through a desert <laughs> drinking fucking horse jerky for weeks. Like, can you imagine how good a marble bath would feel after the desert? Holy shit. Um... And she wonders if there are pools and gardens like this in, in Westeros and in King's Landing. And Daenerys thinks, surely, yeah, surely that the, the King's Landing must be this beautiful. Yeah, Viserys always said that the King's La that the Seven Kingdoms were the most beautiful in the world. Um, which, you know, Daenerys is in for a very rude surprise if she's expecting... Um, if she's expecting it to be beautiful in King's Landing. The famously, like, shit-smelling slum of King's Landing. And there's that shit smell again, because just like, just like Tywin's corpse, just like Tywin's army, just like Karth, uh, the, the, the horrible stench of a place, uh, can indicate the corruption and the moral stink of a place. Um, and so Daenerys is going to get a good strong whiff of that shit smell when she flies over King's Landing. Um, and she thinks about how, you know, her Dothraki probably want to, like, plunder King's Landing and burn it. Uh, but Danny thinks, quote, she had no wish to reduce King's Landing to a blackened ruin full of unquiet ghosts. Daenerys specifically thinks that she doesn't want to reduce King's Landing to a blackened ruin. And what does she do in Season 8, Episode 5? She reduces King's Landing to a blackened ruin. Um, I, I, I think that what they're setting up here in the books is Daenerys burning King's Landing. Because um, her whole her whole arc is about, like... Yeah, no, yeah, no, here, yeah. So, 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 so she continues, thinking that I want to make the kingdom beautiful. I want to fill the Seven Kingdoms with fat men and pretty maids and laughing children. I want my people to smile when they see me ride by. The way Viserys said they smiled for my father, Ares II, which they did not, hint, hint. But before that, b b but before she could do that, she must conquer. And right there, that is like the central tension and conflict in Daenerys' arc, is that she wants peace, she wants plenty, she wants everyone to be happy and well. But before she can do that, she must conquer. And that's a problem that she's had in Marine, right? Like, she wants Marine to be, like, peaceful and happy and healthy, but in order to do that, she's got to kill, she's got to burn, she's got to destroy her enemies, she's got to enforce her rule. And that is, like, the difficulty of conquest and of politics and of power and of fire. You know, fire can forge seven kingdoms, but fire can burn and kill. Um, like, this is sort of, like, the other side, I guess, of, like, you know, the previous chapter with Arya's suffering... That's, like, the bad side of ambition and power. But the good side is Daenerys' wish to, like, make the Seven Kingdoms happy and pretty and fat and fountains and beauty. Like, that, that is what power can accomplish if used correctly. Uh, but it's incredibly difficult to do that. Um, and so I think that's, that, that will be the tragedy of Daenerys Targaryen will be, the, the tragedy of, of Darth Daenerys the Wise will be that she, want, she has good intentions, but a lot of people are going to burn because of her good intentions. Uh, and that includes King's Landing in the end. Though I think the circumstances will be very different. Um, and I think part of it is... Part, part of, like, how King's Landing will burn uh, from Daenerys will be because of the legacy of her father, Ares. That's why Ares is mentioned here. Oh, the way that Viserys said that they smiled for my father, Ares. Ares tried to burn down King's Landing. He tried to reduce it to a blackened ruin. And his wildfire is still underneath the city. So... Daenerys, I think, will set off that wildfire, whether, like, by accident or whether by ignorance or whether by knowing that it's there but taking the risk anyway. Like, the, the, the horror and the fire comes from Daenerys' blood and Daenerys' ancestry and the legacy of the Targaryens, which, which, which is kind of shit in that it's like, well, you know, it's not Daenerys' fault that her father was crazy. It's not Daenerys' fault that Ares filled the city with caches of explosive wildfire. 
So, like, when the city burns because of that wildfire, is that really Daenerys' fault? Like, I don't know how I feel about that, but, I mean, you know, of course, like, we can only speculate on how exactly this is going to go down. I'm, I I feel quite sure that it will not be like it was in the show. I don't think she's going to deliberately burn hundreds of thousands of innocent people just because she's angry after the city has already surrendered. Like, that, to me, is absurd. Um, but I think that she will burn King's Landing. Um, just the circumstances will be a bit more complicated and it'll tie into her, the legacy of Ares and it'll tie into like the necessities of conquest. It'll tie into her belief in herself as a prophet, pro- prophetic messianic figure. Like that's the other thing that like, you know, the, the show didn't really do so much was talk about Daenerys's interest in prophecy. Like Quaith doesn't appear to Daenerys again uh, in the show. Uh, whereas in the books, she, she appears several times, um, even after she's left Calf. Um, so, I think all of those will be factors when Daenerys burns King's Landing. But before she could do that, she must conquer. Uh, and she thinks of, you know, the people in Westeros, she thinks of Robert Baratheon, who was strong as a bull and fearless in battle, which he no longer is. Uh, and she thinks of the usurper's dogs, the cold-eyed Eddard Stark with his frozen heart. And the Golden Lannisters, so rich, so powerful, so treacherous. And, like, from our perspective, it's funny that Daenerys is, like, throwing Tywin Lannister and Ned Stark in the same basket of monkeys. Because from our perspective, those people couldn't be more different. We think of Ned as heroic and honorable and and Tywin as as evil and monstrous. But from her perspective, they're all the usurper's dogs. Uh, And so, you know, she's not going to have that nuance when she arrives at Westeros. She's not going to know... Um, all the complexities and all the subtleties of all these these people and these houses and these histories. She's not going to know why things are the way they are in Westeros. So how can she possibly, you know, sensitively and appropriately and justly take over when she doesn't know these things? She is going to look like this crazy conqueror just rolling on in with dragons, um, you know, probably killing young Griff and, you know, making more enemies than friends is what's going to happen. And they did kind of do that in... Um, in the show. Um, so she thinks of Khal Drogo and um, she thinks about what she'll need to take over Westeros. She feels doubts, but she believes in her prophetic destiny. Um, and then Jorah comes back from the docks and he has news. Uh, he met this guy, Kahuro Mo, who is captain of a ship, the Cinnamon Wind, out of the Summer Isles, and he brings news that Robert Baratheon is dead. So. Daenerys is overjoyed to believe to, to find out that her enemy, the usurper who destroyed her family and took her throne, is dead. So she sees this as an opportunity to take Westeros. And the Cinnamon Wind, by the way, this ship that Kahuro Mo captains, um, that's the one that Sam later takes from Bravos to Old Town. And then Marwan the Mage takes the Cinnamon Wind uh, to Marine from Old Town. Uh, so I wonder if we might see Kahuro Mo again, because Daenerys promises, oh, Kahuro Mo. You're a cool guy. You brought me this great news. So I'm going to reward you one day. So I wonder if Daenerys will reward him and how she will reward him. Um, Nono in the live chat says that Daenerys attracts all the worst people uh, to her. Bet even Darkstar ends up on her side. Yeah, she has some terrible fucking advisors. Like, you know, you know, Tyrion is going to be Daenerys' advisor and he basically wants to burn and wreak vengeance on Westeros. Uh, Marwyn is deeply questionable, profoundly questionable, um, and yeah, I can imagine Darkstar signing up for, you know, Daenerys' Queensguard, stealing the sword Dawn, wanting to, you know, use Daenerys' power as a way to empower himself, like, that's what always happens, is it's, it's the second sons, um, who support the rebel and support the usurper, because they hope to change the balance of power, so... Daenerys might not be friends with our friends. She might be friends with our enemies. Um, So Daenerys is excited that Robert is dead, killed by a boar, um, or betrayed by his queen, or betrayed by his brother, or betrayed by Lord Stark. There's lots of different rumors, but everyone agrees that Robert is dead. And it's kind of fun seeing how, like, you know, way off in eastern Essos... Um, no one's quite sure of exactly what's true about what's happening in Westeros. Just like when we're in Westeros, no one's quite sure. There's lots of rumors swirling about what's happening in the East. Like we hear all these rumors of, oh, there's a three-headed dragon born in Karth or in the Dothraki Sea or, or Volantis or somewhere. Like no one knows exactly what's going on. It's cool to see that in reverse from the East. Um, so Joffrey sits the Iron Throne and the Lannisters rule. 
and Lord Stark has been seized for treason, and Jorah's like Ned Stark a traitor? Not bloody likely. The long summer will come again before that one would besmirch his precious honor. So, you know, Jorah is bitter about Ned's honor because, of course, Ned's honor and commitment to the rules is why Jorah was exiled, because Jorah sold slaves. Um, and that's why um, that's why he had to flee Westeros, because Honorable Ned Stark wanted to punish him. So it's funny that Jorah's like, huh, that, that fucking dickhead with all of his rules and his morality, screw him. Uh, but it also shows how, you know, Ned Stark's reputation for being honorable uh, truly is, uh, he's renowned for it. And Daenerys says, ah, what honor could he have? He was a traitor to his true king Ares, just like the Lannisters. Um, like dogs tearing someone apart. So, so you know, it's funny that, you know, Daenerys is not inclined to see the subtleties and the nuance of Westerosi politics. Which makes me think that'll continue um, when she invades Westeros. And there's going to be, you know, there's going to be bad people burned by Daenerys, but there's going to be good people burned by Daenerys as well. You know, she just she just doesn't have the context. She hasn't read the previous five books like we have. Um, so I think that some good people are going to be burned by Daenerys. Um, and Kahuro Mo sort of sucks up to Daenerys a bit. Um, and Kahuro Mo says that, well, you know, you don't need to repay me. Uh, because, um, because you have, you have rewarded me already because I have seen dragons. So everyone's very excited to see the dragons, which, which would be crazy. Like imagine seeing dragons after hundreds of years of extinction. It'd be like seeing a velociraptor. It'd be like going to Disneyland and seeing a fucking Tyrannosaurus Rex. Do you reckon, do you reckon they'll do that soon? Like, like I, I'm sort of disappointed that it hasn't happened already. Like we have had animals unextincted. I think, um, it's called the... Pyrenean ibex or the something ibex uh, is a kind of deer creature that went extinct but then they unextincted it because uh, they used a cloning process called somatic cell nuclear transfer and they got and, and, and they like got the DNA of this extinct animal and they put it inside the embryo of a similar animal and then they birthed it they they created they they birthed an animal that had been extinct this kind of ibex and it didn't live for very long because cloning is um doesn't work that well yet but um it's possible animals have been unextincted so it makes me think that what we should maybe like i mean should is a strong word but i'm surprised that someone hasn't already tried birthing dinosaurs i mean the problem is that you've got to do it with similar animals first like you like you can't like birth a tyrannosaurus out of a sheep i imagine but you got to find similar anim- like like they're talking about bringing back mammoths like if you if you got some mammoth dna and then you put it in an embryo in an elephant you could probably birth a mammoth that would be cool why don't we go to a zoo and go see a, a, a mammoth ride a mammoth mammoth rides man mammoths would probably stink anyway uh so you know mahuro is excited to see a dragon an unextincted animal um and Jorah's like, ah, you know, maybe you shouldn't be telling everyone that you want to go invade Westeros. And, um, and Daenerys is like, no, 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 look, this is great. You know, the death of Robert changes everything. Before, the Seven Kingdoms were united under Robert, but now they fly to pieces, just like my Kalisar did when Drogo died. So now's a great time to invade. Which, you know, she's speaking with a lot of confidence about a the political situation in a continent that she's never been to and doesn't know much about, but all right. But Jorah's like, yeah, now look, the, the High Lords have always fought. Like, it doesn't really matter. Like, tell me who wins the fight and I'll tell you what it means. But, like, the Seven Kingdoms are not going to fall into your hands like so many ripe peaches. You'll need a fleet, gold, armies, alliances. And Daenerys says, I, I know all that. I know all that. But look, I'm not the frightened girl that, that you met in Pentos. I'm only 15 years old, true, but I am as old as the crones in the Dosh Colleen, and as young as my dragons. I've born a child, burned a carl, and crossed the red waste. Mine is the blood of the dragon. So she's really got that goddamn Targaryen self-important streak, doesn't she? She's got a certain amount of ego, uh, does our Daenerys Targaryen. Um, and Jorah says, well, Viserys uh, was also blood of the dragon. Um, and Daenerys says, I am not Viserys. And Jorah's like, oh, well, yeah, okay, I guess you're more like Rhaegar. Uh, suck up, suck up. Uh, but even dr even dragons can die. And Daenerys says, well, dragons die, but so do dragon slayers. And she kissed him lightly on an unshaven cheek. So that is Daenerys 2, A Clash of Kings. Uh, that is her 
introduction to Carth, um, and that is the beginning of this sort of long, colourful diversion <laughs> on the road to her actually uh, heading to um, Westeros. So, I don't know, it's, it's a cool chapter. Um, I, I like the psychedelic, colourful imagery. Um, I enjoy Piet Pri and Zara and Daxos and Quaithe as sort of inscrutable as they are. Um, they are memorable and fun. And the House of the Undying is great. I mean, the House of the Undying is for sure the uh, highlight of the whole Quaith, uh, the whole Karth arc, I think. And that actually has sort of import for the rest of the series. And that's sort of the problem of a lot of Karth is that um, a lot of it doesn't have much of an impact on the series. Um, but, uh, yeah. All right, look, uh, we're going to wrap up the stream now. Uh, it's been fun. It's been cool. It's been real. Uh, thank you so much for participating in the 100th episode. Um, we're going to do the draw of the uh, random prize winner for the charity raffle. So... If you want to be in the running for the prize that we're going to draw really soon, uh, donate now at the link. It's all going to UNICEF. Uh, we have already raised over a thousand bucks, which is fantastic. Uh, 1100 bucks. Yeah, that's great. Um, and yeah, thank you all so much for doing alt shifty stuff, guys. Thanks for being shifty with me. Um, we're going to do another episode uh soon i'm sure the next one is a brand four a clash of kings and that'll be fun as well um uh yeah so i'm so glad that all you guys have enjoyed this series uh i did not expect this to go for 100 episodes when i started this years ago um but i'm so glad that you all have enjoyed it and i'm looking forward to doing many more um and hopefully we will uh get another book the winds of winter to continue the series so that no doubt we'll be uh, doing this for another zillion years. All right, so we're going to draw the prize now. Uh, if you did donate, it'd be good if you stuck around just in case you're the winner, you know. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to copy and paste the big list of donors. So like, this is your last chance right now. If you want to donate, it's going to UNICEF. If you want to be in the running for the prize, you got to do it right now uh, at the link in the description. And uh, we're going to randomly select, I'm going to go to random.org to generate a random number. Um, and that's going to, actually, that's what I'll do. Like I've, I've got the list on Streamlabs of all the donations and uh, super chats. Uh, and so I'm going to choose a random number with random.org and then uh, whoever is that number donor will get it. Oh, actually, it doesn't let me scroll down far enough. Fuck. <laughs> uh, all right. What we might do is I'll announce the winner on Twitter, which is annoying because it would have been easier to... Um... Yeah, Streamlabs doesn't show me the full list, it looks like. All right. All right. We're going to end it here, and I'm going to announce the winner on Twitter uh, very shortly. Cool. Cool. All right. Thanks so much, guys. We'll do another episode soon. Uh, like and subscribe. Subscribe to the podcast. Uh, and uh, thanks so much for giving it a charity. Um, and yeah, everyone gets just one entry. doesn't matter how many times you donate. The small text is in the description. Um, Kara in the live chat says, random generators are never actually random. I think random.org like, is aware of that and tries to be truly random. I'm not sure how they actually attempted to do that. It's based on like, uh, yeah, atmospheric noise, which, you know, it's not really any more random than anything else is. Anyway, all right, we're done. Thanks, guys. Uh, keep it Shrifty. Uh, you can join the uh, Shrifty fan group on the Facebook page linked in the description if you'd like. You can follow the podcast. Uh, but otherwise, keep it real, stay hydrated, and uh, see you next time. Cheers. Bye.